All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 17th, 2023, and I am excited for this one. Man, you know, as I get going in videos, I generally get excited as I get going because there, <laughs> the revelation is so, so incredible. The books have truly opened and they continue to open and we can prove it. We can show it in history. We can show it from Genesis to Revelation. It's all true. Man, it keeps blowing my mind. And today is another one of those exciting, exciting videos. So we're going to talk about a video today. Uh, in this video, talk about a video as we reveal it in Scripture. And this video is the one of that kid Nathaniel or Nathan. Nathan, I think. Yeah, Nathan. So this video, the reason I'm sharing it is it came up in the forum again. And for anybody who doesn't know what I talk about when I'm talking about the forum, you can come to Ministry Revealed by clicking here or just go to ministryrevealed.com if you want to join us there. There's close to 1,200 people around the world. Um, it's free to sign up. Take you a few seconds. Like-minded brothers and sisters in there uh, sharing and info and, and Bible studies, all sorts of things, news, events. Uh, prayers, requests, all sorts of things. So, and also before I forget, because this is something I always forget to do, please like, share, and subscribe. Most, I, I shouldn't say most, about 25% of all views aren't even subscribers. So please like it. Let's get this out and let's get more people to grow in the revelation. That's why I'm doing all these shorts. The whole purpose of all of these shorts where I don't really like to show my face, but I have to do these shorts, is to reach more people. And so like, share, and subscribe, that's a way to do it as well. So in the forum, this video was brought up again. And this one here is great because it has the English voiceover. So it's really, really good one to hear. And we're going to break down parts of it tonight, but we're not going to do it in order because the video actually isn't in order. Um, this boy died in 2015 right around uh, Tabernacles. And this video, he's with the rabbi. He was never, he wasn't a studied Jewish kid. He's he was only 14, almost 15 here, uh, back in 2015. And a lot of people end up dismissing it. We've talked about it a, a, a couple times over the years. And now I'm gonna share with you what some of the things are that he talks about. But I do want you to know in advance that he doesn't know the order because it just it goes from you know, the 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 Mount of Olives splitting in two and he didn't even know it. And the rabbi reads it to him. Then he goes to the Gog and Magog and then he jumps to here. And so you're not really getting it in order. And it's very confusing unless you really know scripture well, in particular prophecy. And we are a prophecy ministry that have the open books and the revelation being revealed. So we're going to spend some time in this today to show you things that we've talked about being proved out. In what he saw in heaven, and none of these things did he know before. He only found out about them three days before this interview, this talk that he gave when he was in heaven. He goes into many, many other things and what happened when he was in heaven and where they took him in different parts. It's pretty wild. But we want to focus on the on the prophecy of the things in the is to come. I want to settle people's hearts to understand what some of the things are that we're looking for at the beginning which we've explained, which we've shared here in this ministry, as well as the things to come right to the end at the splitting of the Mount of Olives. It's absolutely incredible. So this is what we're going to go into. We're going to break this down. It's going to take us in also into something else that we shared on a couple times over the last two, three years when it was brought to my attention. And it freaks me out every time I read it. We talked about it before, uh, the, the, the info about the teacher of righteousness. We're not going to go into everything about the teacher of righteousness, but there are a couple points that we're going to go into based on something that this kid talks about, but also something connected to, to what we know is the beginning, as well as what we know comes at mid-trib and connected to post-trib. All right, so when we go into that part, we're really talking about something in the, the story of Teacher of Righteousness, that the writer doesn't understand how it could be, we're going to prove it out. And then we're going to show how, you know, even in these things, 
people cannot still see the 14 years. They think that this that a certain timing of event is where it all begins. Now, that's more so in this writing of the teacher of righteousness, because when it comes to this kid, he's bouncing around from things at the very beginning. And guess what? On the date that we said, yep, on the date that we said, he literally gives the date to start it all. And um, uh, and then, like I said, goes here and there and everywhere. But we're going to break it down in uh, in like five different portions. It's not all going to be prophecy. As it comes to the end, it will be less about prophecy and and more about things that he saw about about righteousness, about about being uh, prepared, um, about life being a test and, and things that take place and why. So it's a really, really good one. And I'm just I'm so excited to go into these things because there's so many awesome, awesome confirmations that if you especially for those that have been around for a while, it, it just solidifies everything. It should strengthen you and say, oh, my goodness, we knew this and we can understand it. Even in the jumping around everywhere, we can break it down and, and, and understand it. It's so, so awesome for anybody that's new to the ministry. We always recommend if you're relatively new or brand new coming across this video, you want to come to this playlist here and click on this one right here, the Revealed End Time, End Time Study Note series, and watch the first four videos. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com. Here's the website right here. There's like 400 or something videos on here, so it might take a few seconds to load up. There's the, the homepage, which, by the way, we wrote a book back in 2020 in March. Um, you can download it for free in English and PDF or in four other languages. There's five languages available for free. You can download the book in audio in English for free. You can read the book on the website for free. Or if you would like to have a physical paperback or read it on ebook, then you can go to Amazon. But it's not necessary that you buy it unless that's just the way you like to read it. We make it available for everybody in all options. Now, the other thing, like I was saying, so that intro where you want to come is right here. You click on the intro page. And when you come to the intro page, there's four first videos to watch. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Then it goes deeper, all right? These four, fir four first videos are going to explode your mind. If you have ever questioned or asked, why are there so many differences Within the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, hold on to your horses because this reveals it to you. Why are there so many differences within the discourses? Why is Matthew's discourse two chapters? Mark's discourse is one chapter. It speaks a little bit different than Matthew's. And why is Luke's completely different? The answer will be revealed as you begin to go down the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. This video right here is a 22-minute intro to give you the layout of what's coming in the next three okay so it gives you a brief overview of the next three videos this one is a 30 minute intro to reveal that these differences within the gospels are all prophecy you see we've been told all our lives that it's that it's just it's perspective so you know when you understand that scripture is was is and is to come so was is old testament until christ New Testament is the is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape. And then from that moment, it's the is to come. Was, is, and is to come. And in the was and in the is, there is prophecy all throughout Scripture that we've been revealing here for six years being uh, uh, given to us to show the is to come and to clear it up and make it known to those who will listen. That's what you're going to begin to notice, that these differences in the Gospels are not perspective because there are some things you cannot explain by perspective. And I'll give you one that we love to share, and it's the differences in the colors of the robes that Jesus wears before going to the crucifixion. In Matthew, he wears scarlet. In Mark, he's, it says that he's purple. But in Luke, it says that it's gorgeous. And the word gorgeous means a white, radiant, gorgeous robe. Well, either these guys were colorblind, or there's something else going on. And what do you know about the tribulation? Well, white, a gorgeous white robe is what a bride would wear. And that's what Luke's has. 
Mark and Matthew both have what? Tribulation colors. Purple and scarlet are what the woman wears riding the beast. Purple and scarlet. That's because Mark and Matthew's group are the tribulation of seals and trumpets. Mark's is the pre-trib. So that's why we read in scripture, what, um, um, the last will be first and the first will be last. So we've all studied from the gospel of Matthew, not realizing the importance of who Mark and who Luke are speaking to. And in the end, instead of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it will be Luke, Mark, and Matthew of the Synoptic Gospels. That's what you're going to begin to understand in this first 30-minute Bible study. You can do a one-click download. So if you want to download it to your device, one-click download. <clears throat> you can watch it at any time. You can also click on the study notes. When I have study notes in a video that I'm reading from, you can click and download those to read as well. Here's the second 30-minute intro. And what it does is you're going to realize once you understand who the differences in the Gospels are speaking to, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to understand that the end of days isn't seven years as we've been taught. It's 14 years and a little portion called above. And that's Luke is the above. Mark is seven years of seals. Matthew, seven years of trumpets. And when you understand this, wait until you, you develop and you grow in the revelation. You're going to see. The discourse is revealed to you as you have never, ever seen in your life, and everything will become so much more clear. It's, it's over the top how clear it comes, and we can prove this. This isn't just whimsical. This is stuff that's been going on for six years, and we could show it from the creation stories all the way to the end of Genesis. From there, this is a big study video. It's two hours and 45 minutes, and it's all because of Matthew. The reason for that title is because for centuries and for all of our lives, we've been taught in the church and the seminaries have taught all from a foundation of Matthew's gospel. All of Matthew's gospel. We rarely go to Mark and even less do they go to Luke because they just look to Matthew as the main one. And it's all because of Matthew. What that means is because everything has been learned from Matthew, everybody's foundational thinking comes from the gospel of Matthew. So they don't realize when you read Matthew's gospel, you're reading the seven years of trumpets. Hello. That's why people only believe in seven years, because their entire foundation comes from Matthew. And prophetically, it comes from Matthew 24, which is what you hear people say all the time. How often do you hear people say, oh, let's go to Matthew, uh, Mark 13. Let's go to Mark 13. Hey, let's go to John, uh, uh, Luke 21, Luke 21. Almost never to the point of never. It's always Matthew 24. When you understand the differences of the Gospels, that will all change, I promise you. All right? So that's where new people should always, always start. And um, also, here's our sister Petra, uh, our sister from uh, South Africa. She has a new website with uh, some of the other sisters called His Fair Maidens. It's not just for sisters. It's for brothers and sisters. It's the preparing of the worker bride of Christ. We know that there is a pre-trib group taken and a portion who remains. We know that they're most likely going to be connected to 14ers as the originals were called 14thers because of the 14 days to Passover. And it turns out that there's a group in the end of days called 14ers for the 14 years of tribulation. Well, she doesn't just focus on that, but all of the connections around it, the, the breakdown of the understanding, and it goes into a whole lot of details from teachings, prophetic words that she's had, dreams and visions and their interpretations. So she goes into a bunch of things. So you can check it out. The website is fairmaidens.com. And as you guys all know, those who have been around for a while, um, we support, you know, the ministry is always in need of support because we do help others and we got to pay the bills here. But we also support a ministry uh, with as much as we possibly can over in Uganda. And our brother over in Uganda, they had just recently planted a church and built up a church. And uh, a windstorm came through and destroyed it all. So as you can imagine, there's going to be some cost there to get the thing rebuilt. And so if you'd like to support the ministry, you can, you can do it either in links under any of these videos you can do it from the website. You even saw maybe a link right here. So you can go to PayPal here. You can go to go. Oh, sorry. You can go to PayPal here. You can go to GoFundMe. You can go to the link in here called uh, to donate. 
But if you're on YouTube, one of the easiest things is either go under the videos or this is on all the channels. Just click right here for more links. When you come to four more links, you scroll down. You have our shipping address if, the, if anybody wants to send anything. Or you can come down here to the GoFundMe link or the PayPal link. So with that, we appreciate it. We appreciate all the support. We, should, we appreciate the prayers. And not just now, like just from the beginning. You know, I know what I'm called to do. I'm doing it. And I know the Lord provides the way all the time, just as he is not only for us and for those in the ministry, but uh, for our brothers and sisters over in Uganda. The The mission out there is is gangbusters. The amount of people that you, that we have all helped to reach with the word of God, with preparing them in the revelation, with preparing them with Cindy's book for, for salvation. In a testimony, it is by the thousands, guys. And they're planting churches. And pastors are now calling them to come and teach their people and to prepare them. Awesome. And we're all a part of that. So I want you to remember that, whether in support or in prayer. So please keep everybody in prayers in this as well. All right? So now let's get started. Let's get started in this one first. After my sip of coffee, you would think I would invest in a coffee company. We've got a great, I've, sorry, I know it's a little side note, but come on, I'm just talking here. There's a great coffee company up here. Uh, I live in Alberta. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And just north of me, there's this company that brings in beans from South America. And it's this combination that they do. It is absolutely my favorite coffee. And I'll, I'll say who it is. No, there's no support. There's no nothing. They're just small. They're in a few uh, uh, stores in, in, in Western Canada or in Alberta. And uh, it's called, um, uh, um, oh, my goodness, what's it called now? Uh, um... <laughs> I wanted to give him a little shout out. I've only spoken to him once, but uh, um, Wildcat Coffee Company. I get the dark roast. It's so awesome. And you guys know me and my coffee. I'm very particular. So. With that, let's get started. I want you to listen to this. I'm going to bounce around, as I said, to different time, time frames within the video, but we're going to break it down as we go. And as you start to listen to this, especially where I'm starting, you're going to say, see, see, it's starting now. It's starting now. No, it's not starting now in what we know is the prophetic end of days. Okay. Are we... In a, in a typology, are we in typology of the end of days? Yes, because the true end of days, as we've been revealing here over the years, is 21 years and the final 22nd year is the final jubilee. But the first seven easy years, and we're, come, we're in the seventh now, this easy seven years is like the Jacob Leah story. They were seven years. They were so easy. He was so in love. They flew by like days. And it's a picture of the seven years being like days. So there's a representation and a picture of days. What are these final sevens? These last three sevens? Well, they're from the Shemitah counts, right? Seven, 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 seven. 49th year, final Jubilee year. So when we talk about 14 years in the end of days, it's the seven of seals, seven of trumpets, and the portion called above okay which is the 50 days we talk a lot on the 50 days and we're gonna we're gonna touch on them again today as we also talk in other parts as well it's the story as all of you guys know except for those that are new you know when i talk in the in the shorts i share on this almost all the time and it's second corinthians chapter 12 people say well that's not what paul was talking about yes it is yes yes there was an event in the is of what paul was doing here but it is prophecy just as much as the discourses are. It's prophecy just as much as the reason for the differences in the Gospels. Paul is prophetically telling you that the end of days is 14 years and a portion called above. And that this above is when those in Christ are taken to the third heaven. This is the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. That begins right before the 50 days and then the 14 years begin. At the end, in the seventh year of seals, there is the next rapture, which is the caught up, and it goes. they go to paradise. 
And then he talks about coming the third time. So you see, there was a taking, a taking, and a return. Pre, mid, post. Awesome stuff. And we're going to touch on, on some of these areas, actually, as we go through this tonight, based on this video and uh, some of the writings from um, the Teacher of Righteousness. So, as I said, remember, you might think that what he's saying is what's happening right now, but it's not. It's it's a preparation. You see, I I would never... Um, I, I, how do I word this? I don't believe the Lord was just going to bang. Here it goes. It starts. He wants to prepare his people. And you're going to hear as we talk later on into this, we know. And it's something we've been sharing for a long time, for years. What is the purpose of tribulation? What is the purpose of the Lord allowing these wars? To wake up. He's doing it in love. It sounds crazy. Could you imagine? We know how crazy the tribulation is going to be. He says it'll be worse than it was at the creation. That, that's going to be pretty crazy. And what does he say? It's for love. Because if he didn't do it, people wouldn't wake up. Especially in our day and age. Because what age are we living in, brothers and sisters? We're living in the Laodicean age. We are right now in the Laodicean age. And at the moment of the pre-trib escape, guess what? It begins Ephesus again at the beginning of the 50 days. They will play out again over the 14 years. The 50 days and 14 years. Okay, but right now we're in the Laodicean age. So he's allowing these things. He's bringing about these things to wake us up and to wake his people up. And that's what I believe is going on with the war that we're seeing right now between Israel and Hamas. Because... I want you guys to understand this. I, I want you to be reminded, especially those that have been around for a little bit. Remember everything that has been revealed. There's a reason why I'm so excited in all of the teachings. Because my mind is so in awe at everything we've been revealed in hundreds and hundreds of revelations and in a, most of them in places we didn't even know were prophecy and revelation. Mysteries that we didn't even know were mysteries to understand. So when, I'm, when we're sharing and when I'm sharing something like this, I want you guys to know we've understood. It hasn't changed for years. No matter who says what against us, no matter who bashes me or comes against me, the revelation is the revelation. I did it trusting in the Lord that what I was understanding was true, and he continuously proved it in his word. I couldn't go to anybody. <laughs> Could you imagine? Who was I supposed to go ask about the differences that I was seeing in the Gospels and being able to prove them out and then show the 14 years and above? Everybody would have laughed me out of their church. How do I know? Because everyone I've spoken to in the church has since have all laughed and said, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. It's not true. I gave my books out to like 40 different churches in Calgary. You know how many I heard back from? One. You know why I heard back from one? He wanted me to come back and get the three books that I gave for his pastors. How about that? You see? So what did I do? I just did what I can to reach the most I could, which I knew was going to be YouTube. And I just continued to study and follow the revelation. And I want you guys to understand it because I know most of you see it. And even the ones that do see it, sometimes we teeter, right? But there are certain things that we know, and we know them with such clarity that we should be reminded of them when we see what's going on right now. And take a deep breath and know that the Lord is waking up his people, getting them ready for the time that is soon at hand in 2024. He's got to prepare them first. So where do I think we are? I think it's quite possible that where we are is right here in Luke chapter 21 in verse 9. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. You see that? What are we, what are we saying now? But the end is not yet. 
There's craziness. Where, where should this wars and commotions be connected to? It should be connected to Israel. It's all about Israel, the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and then the world. So if these battles are all connected to that, to that land as everything begins, then I would assume this is too. And what's going on right now? There's wars. There's commotions. Some people are terrified. But these are the things that must first come to pass. But it's not the end of days yet. It's not the end yet. That's what I believe we're at right now. And I believe the Lord is using it to prepare the people. To prepare his people and to prepare the world for those who are watching. So let's listen to um, the first little bit here. The first few seconds. Listen to what he says. What you are saying, what you saw in the future. So, gentlemen, we have started to understand a few things. First of all, it all started on September 11th. The War of Gog and Magog started. World War III. It seems to be small until some event causes an all-out war to start. That will be the final sign. At first, we will not be involved in that war, but after that, everyone will unite against us. Yes. And they will fight us because they want Jerusalem. Yes. And now you say you... Okay, you see that? So, right off the bat, he's talking about Gog and Magog. Now, we're f almost about 40 minutes here into it. So where there's other things before of events that took place in heaven, then he starts talking about some stuff with Gog and Magog. We know where Gog and Magog is. It's not the war that starts everything. We know it's the end of seals, okay? World War III is coming, but that is not the Gog of Magog war. We know that one from Zechariah 39. We know it. It's the end of seals when the Lord comes. And how do we know it? Because they'll be burning weapons for seven years. What is this burning of weapons for seven years that we know of? Let's go to it real quick. Watch this. Let's make sure this is clear for everybody that you understand it's not the war of Gog and Magog. Uh, Ezekiel 39. Okay, so in Ezekiel 39, since fire to Magog, and then what? And the spears, they shall burn them with fire seven years. Why are they burning them with fire for seven years? Well, you guys understand it. OK, you've got your six years of seals. When does the Lord come? He's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, right at this line between six and seven. So what do we know about the seventh? Well, this is a picture, as we've been sharing, of the six days typology of unleavened bread and the seventh is rest, which means the war is going to end in the sixth year of seals. And what do we see in Ezekiel in the chapters to years? There's Ezekiel 39 right there fits right in our chapters to years in the typology, in the prop prophetic understanding of when this war is going to be. And how do we know? Well, unleavened bread, the seventh day is, is the solemn assembly in that seventh year, which is where the great multitude rapture and everything else is. So what do we see when it says that they're after this war, then they're going to burn weapons for seven years? Well, that's because it's going to be one year of seals they're going to burn. First year of trumpets, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. You see? So the sixth year of trumpets is what? With the seventh year of seals, that's seven years. That's when, then what happens? This is then when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of 13, start of the 14th year. This is the picture of seven days as seven years of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles isn't a solemn assembly to the Lord on the seventh day. It's not until the eighth day, the new beginning, which is a picture of the final jubilee. And what do we know happens in this 14th year? It's the year of the Lord's vengeance, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. Right? So what, do we, what else do we know happens? Well, we just saw in Ezekiel that they're going to, what? They're going to turn their weapons, right? They're going to turn their weapons into plowshares and burn their weapons for seven years. And what did we reveal in Joel? Joel chapter one is a picture of in the typology of pre. Chapter two is a mid and chapter three is post. Well, look at what we read in chapter three. You ready for this? This is a picture of post trip. Watch what happens. Verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Well, how about that? You go from having weapons you beat them into plowshares and you're burning things for seven years. And then you take those plowshares and those pruning hooks and you turn them back into spears. When? After the seven years. 
That's what Ezekiel's telling you. Awesome stuff, guys. Awesome, awesome stuff. Okay? So we know where this battle of Gog and Magog is. But I want you to listen a little further. And you got to remember, he's 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 saying everything he's seeing and what he saw. And it's he can't even remember. Like, th there's things that he can't even explain. And it's back and forth. And it's mixed together. And this rabbi is actually quite good. He's understanding. He knows what this kid said because he's heard it from many, many other people that have gone to heaven or that, that have died and gone to the Lord. They've seen these events. <clears throat> and the rabbi, being very well studied, understands that the kid is bouncing back and forth everywhere. And so that's why I'm taking parts from here and parts from there. And even in these conversations, it's bouncing around. But now listen to what he says next. Thank you. Just said that, but not in chronological order. I'm trying to make some order here. Go. They'll fight against us, and the army will hold out for two days. It will hold out for two days. That's all. And after that, no army. No army. Finished. And then they come in. They come in. They kidnap people. They kidnap people. They kill them. They kill people. Rockets, missiles, you name it. Wait, wait. Now we get to the... See, so that sounds like right now, doesn't it? But we know it isn't because it's connected to the Gog and Magog war. But then he jumps back and listen what he's about to say next. The part about the rockets and missiles. Yes. I heard about that from a lot of sources, and there was also a prophecy that talks about a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb, but the bomb will be small, not large, and God will just stop it in the sky, and it won't fall. You mean they will fire a nuclear bomb at us, and God will freeze it in the sky? He will freeze it in the sky, and after a few weeks it will fall, but it will only fall on two cities, Tel Aviv and Haifa. The nuclear bomb will only fall on those two cities? Yes, those two cities. Okay. There you go. Right off the bat. You see, this is a great opener for us. He says that he saw where this begins is Haifa and Tel Aviv. And he goes on later in it, Haifa and Tel Aviv, and then they want to make their way to go down to Jerusalem. Okay? What he's talking about right here is not Gog and Magog. What he was talking about earlier, there was Gog and Magog in it. You see? But if you don't understand the 14 years and, and the revelation of the differences in the Gospels, to be able to pull these things out from the discourses and the timing within the prophets to the Psalms, to the creation story, to revelation, you're not going to be able to discern this because it's, it's all over the place. Who do we know attacks the first two places in the north? Haven't we been talking about two places in the north, Haifa and Tel Aviv, for a few years now? Haven't we recently this year, when we were revealed Isaiah 9, the entirety of the revelation of this? This is awesome. You know, Isaiah 9. I know we talked on it a lot until recently, but it's awesome. You see, nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. This is a prophetic picture of two northern cities in Israel or north of Jerusalem, which are pictures, a typology of Haifa and Tel Aviv. Is this the great affliction? No, it's the light affliction. What do we know about this light affliction? We know that this light affliction comes first. We know it. We've proven it. It's that portion called above. It's that portion called above 14 years. And we have proven a dozen different ways that the above 14 years is a period of 50 days. How does the 50 days play out? The pre-trib escape happens on the true feast of first fruit, uh, the, the true feast of weeks. On whatever year it's going to start, which I believe we can prove that it's going to be 2024. At the true Feast of Weeks, when the harvest of the winter wheat is ready and they're going to crush the wheat, make bread, and bring it in. That is the true time of the Feast of Weeks. The pre-trib, gone. When the pre-trib is gone, whether it's exactly at the same moment or, or near that same time, the pre-trib escapes and this first light affliction on two northern cities begins. We shared in the last video this incredible connection to the book of Judges chapter 3 and 4 with Ehud. We know prophetically there's an Ehud Omer and there's an Ehud Barak. Both of them were prime ministers in Israel. And right now, we know there's an Ehud Omer who has been trying to do a peace deal with the Palestinians for a long time. And he was 99% of the way there in 
2008 or 2009 before he was ousted and Netanyahu came in. Okay? But we also know there's an Ehud Barak. And Ehud Barak is the far left or left-handed, if you will. And right now, in the background, it's not being shared on the news, but we've seen it through those on the ground and other people uh, involved in government there that there's a coup in the background by Ehud Barak. And we went to chapter four and we saw after Ehud was dead that another one comes into power and his name is Barak. So we have an Ehud Barak. No, this is not Barack Obama. Don't get confused by that. This is Ehud Barak. And where does Ehud Barak take with the 10,000 men of the children of Neftali and Zebulun? And it just so happens right now that there's somebody uh, uh, conspiring with military who was a former prime minister who's left-handed, far left, trying to come back, whose name is Ehud Barak. And it would appear maybe he does end up taking control or taking power back in, in a few months. At least for sure at some point before what? Neftali and Zebulun? That's exactly what Isaiah 9 was just telling us. It would appear that this is going to happen before the light affliction in Zebulun and Naphtali. This is the picture that the boy is talking about. Well, young man now is talking about. When the light affliction begins the 50 days. Pre-trib escape, this light affliction begins. There's the seven-day lay, a Gentile wedding that will take place in heaven. The Lord will then return. For 40 days, as we've been revealing here for years, he is coming as the son of man. He is not coming as, as Lord and Savior Messiah. He's coming as the prophet. He's coming as, you guys know who, right? He's coming as Jonah. He's coming as Jonah, just like he told us in Luke 11. He is coming as the white horse rider. The, the Muslims know about it that we've shared with you. They know he's coming for 40 days, and he's been, they've already been convinced and been told through their prophetic words, their, their prophetic books, that he's actually the Christian Antichrist. But he's going to do so many incredible things while he's here that many will think that he is the Christ. But the majority won't. Just as he tells us in, uh, in Luke chapter 17. And when his 40 days are done, just as, as he is the white horse rider and he's gone, what do we know comes next? Well, in those 50 days, if it was pre-trib, seven-day wedding, he returns on the eighth day, starts his 40. That leaves three days to what we call Acts 2.0, when the time of the grape harvest is ready. But there's three days left. We know there's three days left. So if we look at this, for example, in 2024. We know the count begins from when the sickle is put to the wheat. It's at the time of Jesus' birthday and the 15th of Sivan. You count seven Sabbaths, one, true Sabbaths. The 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th. There's the first Sabbath, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, sixth, seventh Sabbath. This I believe, is the absolute pre-trib Bride of Christ escape date. This then begins the first light affliction in Haifa and Tel Aviv by Iran. It seems chaotic already right now in Israel, but it will settle. This is the wars and commotions to begin to wake people up, but it will settle. This one here, with tens of millions having vanished, is the beginning of the end of days. This begins your above, well, even right here, above 14 years. You count your 50 days right here. There's your first day of the wedding. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Lord returns right here on the eighth day. He's here for 40 days as the Son of Man. His last day is the 26th of Elul. When he leaves, there's one, 
two, three days left. What happens on the third day? See, what happens on the third day? The 27th of Elul, the 28th, and the 29th. What do we know happens? The raven spirit gets sent out, right? Just like we show in, in Genesis. The raven spirit is that antichrist spirit that goes out, that, that Ishmael type. What does the raven represent? The Arab. The Arab. His, it means dusky hue from the complexion of the skin. He is the prophetic Ishmael type. Who is the prophetic Ishmael? The one who brought destruction of Israel and had them flee at the year's end to the start of the year. Who is it prophetically? It's going to be Syria. We've shared it many times. But when the Son of Man is gone, what comes next? One, two, three days. What happens at the beginning of those three days? The raven spirit has gone out. The raven spirit. What, what happens here? The compassing about of Jerusalem. This is what is going to cause World War III. What's going to happen on day one? Well, do you think by day three right here, as, as they're coming to destroy, when they will destroy Jerusalem, and people will be fleeing to the mountains, taken captive. Do you think that it's just going to suddenly happen? So they've been compassing the Babout on the 30th or the 27th of Elul, and they're compassing the Babout more, and they're closing in. Do you think Israel's not going to do anything? Of course they are. Is there already going to be chaos in the world and other events taking place? Of course. But don't you think it's going to start with something? This is when he gets the Antichrist spirit. There's probably already going to be some battling going on. Maybe some sort of attack to get them in closer. But right here, that's it. This is the beginning. Whether it's day one or day two, this year's end, this final day, is when the attack happens. But before it happens, on the 29th of Elul, which is true Pentecost, when the new wine harvest is ready for new grapes, for new wine, this is the anointing of the Holy Ghost by those people I was telling you are connected to the disciple workers who remained from going pre-trib that were chosen to remain to work for the Lord. I'm going to show you some of that tonight, too. I'm going to show you some of who they're connected to. Okay? It's crazy. It's, it's amazing stuff. So we've dissected this 50 days that comes first like it's never been understood before. We have all all or most of the parts and pieces. You know, what's all going to happen during the 40 days of the Son of Man? Well, we don't know every part. We don't know everything where they're going. But Luke 21 gives us more detail. In all the prophetic typologies of Christ coming at the beginning before it all starts, We've seen it in so many parts of Scripture. From Luke 24 into, into Acts chapter 1 into, and then into 2, we, we see it in the, in the typology of the transfiguration in Luke. We see it in the, in the picture of the uh, um, uh, triumphal entry in Luke. It's the 40 days of the Son of Man. And on the 27th of Elul, the Antichrist spirit, the raven spirit goes out, and we know that this is now going to be the big affliction that follows. Okay? Look what happens. There's the light affliction, which is the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv at the beginning of 50 days after the pre-trib escape. Then you see there's darkness, and what do they see? I want you to remember this. They see a great light. They that dwell in the land of shadow of death upon them the light shined. You see, it's a great light. The light shined. What do we see? For unto us a child is born. And for the longest time, because we know Luke in order, and Luke chapter 2 is a picture of Jesus' birth and the 40 days understanding of the birth, it was believed that this is also telling us the birth. So it would be at Jesus' birthday. And then when the 40 days, the picture of his birth, which is a picture of 40 days, just like Luke chapter 2, we then see Syria. Then now it's the major affliction. You see, 
Afterwards, a more grievous affliction. And what is that one? It's when Syria comes before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open, open mouth. And for all his anger is not turned away, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So the Lord's hand is still stretched out for his people. Syria. It's everywhere it tells us it's Syria. That's This is the Ishmael. This is the Ishmael. This is the raven spirit that comes and attacks. That'll be the beginning of World War III. But before World War III, it's Haifa and Tel Aviv. And right now, everything's going on down in Gaza. In Gaza. If we're still here and we see an attack and there's been no pre-trib and it's and it's Haifa and Tel Aviv getting destroyed, well, hold on tight because you're about to vanish if you're in Christ spirit-filled. But remember this. You're going to see this a little bit later. There's a great light. The light shine. What do we know happens when the Son of Man comes for his 40 days? He calls himself the light of the world. Right? All over the place in the prophetic picture. He's the light of the world. In fact, let me show you one. <clears throat> I'm going to show you another one later. But this one is just come to my thought right now. Watch this. In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus comes as the son of man, he's coming as Jonah was. So Jonah was a prophet. So he's coming to be prophetic as Jonah was. And what did Jonah do? He warned. He was a warning to Nineveh for 40 days. And Jesus says that he's going to do also as Jonah did to this generation. When you read this, it's prophecy. It's in the final generation. Jesus did not fulfill this at his resurrection. He was not warning them and going around during the 40 days, warning and doing these signs of wonders during 40 days. This is prophetic. But why am I also showing you this? Because only in Luke do you see Right after the picture of Jesus beginning his 40 days, do we see a conversation? Light, 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 light. This conversation, the light in you, is the one only found in Luke. Where is it connected? To the Son of Man coming for 40 days. All right, while I'm at it, I'll show you this other one. Watch this with the Gospel of John. In John chapter 7, they think Jesus, many call him a prophet, okay? He gets called a prophet right here, John 7, 40. Many of the people therefore said, when you heard this saying, say, of a truth, this is the prophet. The prophet, uppercase P. W what's this a picture of him saying he's the prophet? He's like Jonah. Well, how do you know this is Jonah? Well, let me prove it to you. Never a man spoke like this before. Nicodemus says, oh, come on. Does our law judge any man before they hear him? Listen to verse 52. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Is that true? Who's the one prophet in Scripture that we have from the from Galilee area, who was the prophet that Jesus says he would be like? Jonah. Jonah. And look at what we see in chapter 8. Watch this. In chapter 8, there's your woman typology, right? Caught in adultery. We see him as if he's on bended knee as he's writing on the sand. We used to share on this a lot. And the, only the woman is left standing alone before him. Jesus is still bent over after having written in the sand. And he looks up and it's only her in the midst of him. And look what comes next. And Jesus spake again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. Uh, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, guess what? That's the same picture. Look at this. John, end of seven to eight. He's the light of the world. What's it the picture of? It's the same picture as Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. He's coming as the light. When? After the first affliction and after the first seven days Gentile wedding. He's coming to shine the light in the darkness. The exact same wording. 
to the exact same typology of the beginning of his 40 days and the 14 years in the chapters to years. Where else do we see this picture of the 50 days that come first? You guys all know this. We've been sharing this one for many, many years. It's found right here in Zechariah 7, verse 5 through 7. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and when you mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even those 70 years, uh, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? All of this is past tense. In chapter 1 of Zechariah, see, 14 chapters, 14 years. Chapter 1 says these 70 years. Chapter 7 says those 70 years, past tense. So for 70 years, they fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month. Why are they talking about the fifth and the seventh month? Well, lo and behold, there's your seventh Sabbath in the true feast of weeks count from when the, when the sickle is put to the wheat or the corn, which is wheat. And then what? The 50 days begin. How do the 50 days begin? With an attack in northern Israel. What was it prophetically? The ninth of Av, when an attack came on it in Jerusalem. It's another attack happening, happening prophetically on the ninth of Av, like has happened to Israel so many times in history. What else happens? 50 days later, there's your 29th of Elul, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And then what? The year's end attack. When? To the fasting of the morning of the fifth month and the seventh month. When do they fast on the seventh month? They fast on the third day, but the event actually took place on the third on the first day of Tishri. But because they, they observe it here, because they don't want to do it on the Feast of Trumpets. But the actual attack happened right here at the end of the year on the at the time of the Feast of Trumpets. That is your fifth and your seventh month. It's given to us right here. Listen to what it says in verse 7. Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited? See, past tense. During the 70 years, they were inhabited. They were in prosperity. And the cities thereof round about her. When men inhabited, past tense, the south of the plain. Are they still in prosperity? Yes. Are they still inhabiting the south of the plain? Yes. Not at the second attack. It's this second attack right here, the one called the one at the year's end by Syria, that brings about the devastation and the beginning of World War III. This is the one that Jesus is warning about in Luke chapter 21. So in Luke chapter 21, it's the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man, but from a specific point. You see, here's where Mark and Matthew's discourses start, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's World War III that begins with the attack and destruction of Jerusalem by Syria, okay? And listen to what it says in Luke 21, 12. We've shared this so many times, right? But before all these, what is before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom? It's what 2 Corinthians called above. It's what Luke 17 says, but before all these, or but first. This is the connection, the 40 days of the Son of Man. And listen to what he does in Luke 21, verse 20. This is Jesus, while he's here as the Son of Man for 40 days, he's going to be warning Jerusalem, okay? And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst uh, out of it, depart uh, depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things that are written might be fulfilled. This is now when this destruction happens. Right here. Whether it's this is day one or this is day one. When this happens, this is the attack. When did the compassing about start? After he left right here in the three days that remain to the year's end or to the 50th day. But before the official attack breaks out on Jerusalem and nation against nation begins, there's going to be the anointing by the Holy Ghost. And at this anointing by the Holy Ghost, just like the Luke group was told, that's why only Luke says it, in Luke's um, resurrection story, we see it right here. Only Luke's group. 
is told that they're going to go out, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So they're going to start from Jerusalem. And when they receive that anointing, they're going out from Jerusalem. Why are they going out from Jerusalem right away? Because it's being compassed about. But before the attack hits, they'll have already left. This is the picture. 27th of Elul is something we've been talking about for months. This is the time frame. Let's continue. Let's, let's listen to a little bit more of what he has to say next. Let's go to the 36-minute mark. Oh, and by the way, when you see these red words pop up, that's just the translation. Some, the, the one who translated this, he put the words that people are asking him in the background in the audience. So you don't really have to worry about those. Just listen to what he says. Yes, he will be buried in Israel. And I saw that when the Mount of Olives split in two, then Messiah will stand at the opening. But he won't care who is religious, who has a beard, who a person is. He sees a person's holiness. He will smell each person. He will smell if someone... We're, we're going to get back. We're going to get back to this part of when the Mount of Olives splits, all right? Don't you worry. I just wanted you to hear that at first. He's holy, if he's pure, if he did good deeds, if he's kind, to see if he has true fear of heaven and not just afraid of punishment and things like that. He won't say, here you are, you have a hat, you can go in. It's not like that. He will have power to feel what is truly inside every person. Nathan, I ask you once again, you know all this from up there. I know all of it from there. A week ago, you didn't know any of this. I didn't know these things. I didn't know. I had no idea. Nothing. Nothing. No, he didn't. He is not a Jewish school student. Wait one second, one second. I just want to say something here. Look at what he's saying, and look, he says that Gog is Obama, and that Gog, Obama, will fall here in Israel. And God will give Obama a grave here in Israel. Here in Israel. So Ezekiel the prophet says, on that day I will give Gog a burial place in Israel. That's exactly what they said to me. Exactly. Ezekiel. Exactly the same thing. And you say that the Mount of Olives will split. The Mount of Olives will split in two. So Zechariah the prophet says, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, and his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. Is that really what is written? Yes, Zechariah the prophet. That's exactly what I saw. <laughs> Zechariah the prophet, he was a long time ago. That is exactly what will happen if things stay as they are. If the world keeps on like this, that is what will happen, for sure. Now, now, a woman asked a good question, and I also want to ask, how will we know when it's starts it will start with a boom first of all all right okay now he's saying it's going to start with a boom so you just saw <clears throat> or just heard how he's talking about the mount of olives and the mount of olives splitting yet he was also talking about gog and magog okay well we know there's there's a gog of magog at the beginning and there's a gog magog at the end okay but we know that there there's two differences going on there, there's a Gog and Magog at the at the end of seals. We know this from Ezekiel chapter 39. We were just talking about it earlier. But what else do we know? Well, we know there's another one. But let me show you something. I want you guys to be able to understand and see these differences so that you don't get confused when you're listening to this because it is not an easy thing to follow. And even the rabbi doesn't even fully get it. Because I want you to understand something. Okay? In Revelation 19, and we're going to get back to this in uh, a little bit later, you're going to see more things that he talks about here as well. But I want you to see this. In Revelation 19, 19, this is before the millennial reign and after, uh, uh, this is in, in at the end of the 14 years, okay? This is the, the great battle, okay? And at the end of tribulation, in 1919, it says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which deceived all them that had received the mark. And now they're both in the fire and brimstone. So at the end of tribulation, the beast and the false prophet are both the first two. <laughs> Excuse me. Are the first two thrown into the lake of fire okay they're the first two thrown into the lake of fire and in the 14th year of tribulation you go to revelation 20 and it's the thousand years okay satan had now been bound cast into uh, uh, bound into hell right uh, um and into the bottomless pit and is bound there for a thousand years when the thousand years are over <clears throat> He goes out 
he has his little time of, of deceiving. And we read about his destruction. And what's it called? Revelation 20, verse 8. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. Now, let me ask you, is this battle of Gog and Magog when the Mount of Olives splits in two at the return of the Lord? No. This is at the end of the millennial reign. When the mountain splits in two, is the Lord coming at the end in the 14th year to start the 14th year? And then there's the big battle. It's not the Gog and Magog battle. It's the one we just read in Revelation 19. This Gog and Magog is at the end of millennial reign. And we know because who's not there? There's no, there's no beast and false prophet. You see? If you go to Revelation 16, <clears throat> I think verse 13. Uh, yeah, verse 13. So these are the bold judgments. So we can know that the bold judgments, which I don't talk about often because they're going to be a very short period of time. And they're going to be in that 14th year, probably in the latter portion of the 14th year. And how do we know? Because in verse 13, it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How are spirits like frogs going to come out of all three when the beast and the false prophet were thrown into the lake of fire in the 14th year of tribulation? Impossible. This tells you that this the, the, the bold judgments will be for all of those who just refuse and will never come to the Lord, no matter what they're put under. This is all their destruction for them. It will not last long. And it's going to take place in the 14th year of tribulation. We don't know exactly where, but probably in the portion of, uh, um, uh, of late 14th year. And how do we know this again? Because all three are there. Yet when you go to Revelation 20, which is after the millennial reign, at the final Gog, of, Gog and Magog, <clears throat> where, by the way, Ezekiel uh, chapter 39, it's not the battle of Gog and Magog. It's the battle of Gog of Magog. There is a difference. And so who goes out to deceive them, to deceive them all? Satan does. Satan does. He can't go out with the beast and the false prophet. Listen to what it says in verse uh, in Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. So they've already been there for a thousand years. And at the end of the millennial reign, when he goes to do this and then the Lord destroys them, now he's there joining them. So there's no way that the bulls, as a little side note, can be at the at the end of the millennial reign and there's no way that gog and magog battle is at the time when when the uh when the mount of olives splits in two and i want i want you guys to understand this so that you can you can be clear about truly understanding these things because as you can see this young man nathan saw so many things and more but he doesn't know their order. He doesn't know when the timing is. And I think a lot of people cast him aside because he thought things were about to happen within months. And of course, they never did. Here we are eight years later. And it's still not official, even though it's starting to look like it. And people would say, see, when he gave this talk, it was the time of tabernacles when it happened. So what does it matter that it was at the time of tabernacles when it happened? It, you have to understand the revelation of what he's talking about. You see, you're not going to be burning weapons for seven years during the millennial reign. There is no the Lord, the, the Mount of Olives splitting in two at the Battle of Gog and Magog. This is when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. The seventh year of seals, the 144 are sealed. The great multitude rapture comes in about midway through the seventh year of seals. 
There's no battling during the seventh year of seals. It's the day as, as unleavened bread, which is the seventh day, the year of assembly to the Lord. Then you've got the seventh seal. And the seventh seal says about the space of half an hour where it was quiet in heaven. I believe a picture of about half a year. The first half is Revelation 7. The second half is the seventh seal in the seventh year. So you can see this difference already in being able to break it down and understand what he's talking about. But there is something he did see in relation to a period of time where he gives a date. And I want you to listen to it very close. Let me go back a few seconds. How will we know when it starts? It will start with a boom. First of all, it has already started. It has started? As far as I can see, it has started. It started on September 11th. Okay. As far as I can see, it has already started. Well, again, remember, we know that he doesn't know time because he thought it already started and, and it was all going to be known World War III starting in like three months or less from when he gave this talk in 2015. But he saw it from heaven and did not understand time it happens to everybody who has these experiences they think it's always immediate but he did see a date ask how will we know when it starts it will start with a boom first of all it has already started it has started as far as i could see it has started it started on september 11th 2015 it has already started he said september 11 2015 is when it started well, we know it didn't start September 11, 2015. So what if we go see what that is and see if we can understand what he's saying? But let's listen to what the rabbi has to say what that date is. On the 27th of Elul last year in 5775. This year, yes. Last Hebrew year. We are in 5776. So it started last year, three days before Rosh Hashanah. God <laughs> Did you hear that? So in 2015, let's go to 2015. Watch this. In 2015, he said on September 11th, huh, look at that date. What did the rabbi say? The 27th of Elul. He says it's going to start with a boom. It's not, it's not the devastating one that destroys Jerusalem, but it's going to start with a boom. And what did the rabbi say? That's one, two, three days, he said before, Rosh Hashanah. What did we just talk about? What have we been talking about here for several months? It starts after the 40 days of the Son of Man, 26th of Elul. The raven spirit goes out. There's three days that remain before the attack at Rosh Hashanah. And right before the attack, the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the true feast of weeks when new wine is ready so that they can have new wine it's the 29th of Elul and when is the attack coming we know it's coming by Syria the raven is going into Syria we just saw it and we're breaking it down in Isaiah 9 where else do we know it I know we just showed this one recently we talked about it a number of times in uh second kings is it 24 yeah no <clears throat> first king no oh sorry second chronicles chapter 24 we saw the story we just talked about it the other day and it shall come to pass at the end of the year what's the 29th of elul that 29th to the first at the end of the year the host of syria will come up against them and they shall come to judah and jerusalem and destroy all the princes of the people thereof so take the, so the spoils and the army of the syrians shall come with a small company of men why? Israel, Jerusalem is the greater army right now. Syria is the smaller one. They're never going to believe this is going to happen in Jerusalem, that they're going to be destroyed by Syria. Prophetic, it's a 100%. It's a done deal. It's going to happen. The Lord will deliver a very great army into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. This is, this is the event that the Lord is warning about 
when he's here for 40 days and he's warning in Luke chapter 21 when you see Jerusalem compassed about. And we've been showing here that when he gets compassed about, that starts three days before the attack. What is that date? Well, when he had this vision, when he, or this, this experience, dying and going to heaven, he saw it was September 11th, and the rabbi said it was the 27th of Elul when it all starts. He gave a date, and then the rabbi said, hey, that's three days before Rosh Hashanah. And, and what, what's the picture of this? The one we've been sharing for years that we were just talking about in Zechariah chapter 7. It's the reason for giving us the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh month, those 70 years. When they were in prosperity and in the plain and south of the plain, all past tense, meaning no longer inhabited after that point, which means there is no... From the 71, there is no 71. There is no observing these things in the 71st year. Bang. Why? Because the war's begun. Do you understand how awesome this is? He just didn't see the right year or didn't understand what year. But nobody's given the exact timing of everything, meaning knowing what year all these events will take place. We've broken it down by showing from the understanding of the fifth and the seventh month of fasting in the morning to the true feast of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat to the 40 days of the Son of Man that leaves three days to the compassing that he's warning about to then the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that true new wine and the attack that begins the 14 years. This other stuff is the, is the stuff that Luke says, but before all these. When it says nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that's where it starts, right here. The 14 years, Mark's discourse, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, it starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. And everybody will know at this point that World War III has started. But could you imagine the chaos already? Just imagine the chaos. Tens of millions of people have vanished. Stones throw, there's going to be some sort of meteor event that takes place that hits the earth. War is breaking out. Northern Israel is the focus, though, because even though there's probably things starting to break out around the world, it's not the actual beginning of World War III until, oh, can you say World War III has been going on for, sev for several years? Sure. Can you say, oh, this is what's going on with Hamas is, is the beginning, the prelude to World War III? Yes. But is it a Officially World War III. No. Not until Jerusalem is destroyed after the warning of the Son of Man, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they go out from Jerusalem, then the attack comes. You guys will remember this as well. This is something I had mentioned a moment ago in passing. You know, we have, um, for those that are newer, I think I even have it in the playlist. We have the um, uh, uh, um, pre, mid, and post typologies. So we can show the prophetic picture of the, of the coming of the Lord for 40 days at the end of the pre-trib. I mean, uh, yeah, the pre-trib escape happens, the wedding, and then he comes at about an eighth day. We can show when the Lord comes in the prophetic picture of the resurrection of Luke, in the triumphal entry of Luke, and in the transfiguration of Luke, they are all giving us a prophetic typology picture within them of the Lord coming for 40 days as Jonah in the end of days. It sounds crazy when people first hear this. Oh, this guy's smoking something out. I promise you. Once you begin with the intro and begin to understand these things and then work your way into all of these revelations and see the details in them, it will blow your mind. It's the entire reason for Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that was, Old Testament to Christ, shall be. The thing that is, from Christ until the pre-trib, shall be. Meaning the was and the is, both are giving us prophetic pictures in the is to come. So look at this prophetic picture, the triumphal entry. Do you know what he says next? You only read it in Luke's gospel? 1941. And when he was come here, come near, 
he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Okay? The Jews are our enemies for our sakes. So we got to pray for them. We don't want to be speaking down and, and destroying the what some Jews might be doing, even if they're attacking Christians. We have to pray for them. We have to understand. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to understand they're blinded for our sakes. So we need to be praying for them over there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what does he say? For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about, about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children with thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Why do you think in the prophetic picture of the triumphal entry of Luke, just like Mark's is the picture of the end of the six years of seals, Matthew's is the picture of the end of six years of trumpets. It's a picture of the times of the comings of the Lord in his different ways. And yet only this one has this. Why? Because it's, it's given us another prophetic picture to Luke 21 when he's warning them about being compassed about before their destruction. <clears throat> it's everywhere. Everywhere. Let's go a little bit further on this piece. Can make God started. Yes, that war has already started. So why don't we sense anything? Because God won't bring it at first. What will happen one certain day, it will just erupt. Something will set off and it will just erupt. All of the news channels, everything. Everyone will say, World War Three has started. Everyone will just... There you go. And when it starts, they will know when Jerusalem comes to be compassed about and attacked, all the news stations and everybody around the earth will know that World War Three has started. It will be declared. But it's not the Gog and Magog. You see, it's the kid thinks it's the Gog and Magog because of the, the confusion of everything he saw. We know what it is. It's the beginning of World War Three. World War Three is not the Battle of Gog and Magog. World War the World War Three, as we've shown in the past. Uh, I think yeah, right even on our timeline chart, World War Three will last for about. Two and a half years. It's going to be chaos. But do you know what we know about this two and a half years during World War III? It's going to be a time like has never been before. Uh, uh, sorry. It's going to be a time of such devastation. But do you know what scriptures call this time? The beginning. It's just the beginning. When Antichrist, after that point, stands up and gets his 42 months when he's given those 42 months to continue. So he was already here to some degree. But at this point, he'll be given 42 months to the end of the sixth year of seals. This is when Antichrist really gets his power on the scene. What What is the first two and a half years? It's the lion, right, from, from uh, Daniel chapter 7. Who's the lion? Assad. Assad. It's even his name. His last name used to mean beast, and the, his father or grandfather changed the name when they got into politics and changed it from beast to lion. The first beast is called, in, the, in, in, in Daniel 7, it says the first beast is a lion. And everywhere in Scripture is telling us at the year's end when this attack comes, it's Syria. <clears throat> it's Syria, brothers and sisters. Who's the bear? Russia. Daniel 7 says, then the, uh, then the bear shows up. Jeremiah chapter 4 says, the bear is then on his way, the destroyer of the Gentiles. Because after World War III begins with the destruction after the attack in Jerusalem, like the, like the, the prophetic was of Ishmael, then you have the bear. <clears throat> and that's the beginning of World War III, you can say, to the rest of the world. And then you've got the leopard. The leopard is going to be that controlling center. 
Europe, somewhere in Europe, you know, probably connected to Germany and, and all in that area, right? The, the Klaus Schwab's and them of the world, most likely. That's going to be the, the control center. And when the Antichrist shows up and he gets that power to continue for 42 months, what does Revelation 13 tell us? It says he will have the mouth of a lion, the body, uh, uh, the feet of a bear, and the body of a leopard. Why? Because he's now taken over their power. He is in power and authority over them when he gets his 42 months to continue. <coughs> this is the point that in Mark's discourse, when it says they're to flee to the mountains because it's the time of the abomination of desolation, which is the time of the mark of the beast, as you read in Revelation 13. And he's got the power of all three of these now. Could you imagine? World War III is simply called the beginning. Let me show you exactly what Revelation 12 says about it. Revelation 12 calls this time pained. Pained. The pre-trib happens, the 40 days of the Son of Man, then the attack on Jerusalem and tribulation begins. This right here, this word pained is World War III. It represents the picture of the next two and a half years or the first two and a half years of tribulation to torture, pain, toil, torment, vex. Just this represents the two and a half years of war, World War III. And then <clears throat> you get this picture of when he's going to be given power by the dragon, as Revelation 13 says. It's incredible, incredible stuff, guys. You guys remember this video? Let's listen to a, a, a few minutes, a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there of this. Let's listen to this. This is something we've been sharing here in this ministry since, uh, <laughs> since March of 2020. Right hours before the pandemic started, and this guy talks about it from a video back 13 years ago in 2010. But I want you to listen to other stuff that he talks about here as well. To try and roll out the sequence of events. Now, what he described is what the sequence of events was. It starts with Israel attacking Iran. No, this hasn't happened yet. There have been a number of indications that, that, that there are forces which are trying to, to, to push this into happening. You've only got to follow the news for the last two years to realize that the public is being prepared for a justification for this kind of thing. Iran is being set up as being the bad guys that deserve something to happen to them and so on and so forth. Now, that's going to be the start of what is like the opening gambit in a big chess game. And the plan is to provoke Iran or China to retaliate. And our guy, our source, who is a military man, is privately as convinced as he can be although this has never been made public and this is not publicly known, that Iran does have nuclear weapons. He believes that they have been provided by China behind the scenes. And all of this is intended because it's all right with these controlling forces that Iran has nuclear weapons because they want them to be used. The plan is for either Iran or for China to retaliate after Iran is struck with a nuclear weapon. At that point, there will be a limited nuclear exchange in the Middle East. Isn't that exactly what the kid said? Nuclear weapon, Haifa, Tel Aviv, a small one. Followed by a ceasefire. He heard this being planned in this meeting. This is being choreographed. It's like the script for a movie. This is exactly what's intended. You see, pre-planned, but not on their timing. God knows it's coming. It's part of the plan. Okay? And, and these elites thinks, think it's their plan. But what did he just say? Then there will be a ceasefire. That's exactly what we talk about. <clears throat> we know that this short attack between Iran and Israel and Haifa and Tel Aviv is going to take place. How long is this short war going to last after Haifa and Tel Aviv are attacked and destroyed? Maybe a week? It won't last very long. There's going to be a call to settle things down. To me, I mean, could it go longer? Sure. But do I think it's going to go longer? No. I think by the time the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days, it will have ceased. Why do I say this? Well, check it out.
let's go back to Isaiah chapter 9. You see how incredible it is to, to follow these things, guys? Here's the light affliction, Zebulun and Naphtali, and afterward, something more grievous, right? And who shows up? Who shows up in the midst of this darkness? Who shows up after this destruction here? In Isaiah 9, 2, it says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death hath the light shine. Who is the light? We know for unto us a child is born. It's, it's the Lord coming for 40 days. We just saw how it was directly connected to John 8, which is the same picture time frame in chapters to years. And there he is as the son of man, as Jonah, Coming to start his 40 days, I am the light of the world, not walk in darkness, but have the light. It was the same wording, which tells me that things must have been settled after that attack, like not going on for too much longer, and that by the time the Son of Man comes, it's settled. Now, you might ask, and you might say, well, wait a second, Alan. <clears throat> I thought you said Jesus' birthday is the 15th day of the third month in Taurus in Savan. It is. It is. Jesus was born in the third month, 15th day of the third month. So then why doesn't the count go from here? Right? Why wouldn't the account, the count start here? So maybe this, people will think, is true Feast of Weeks from Nisan 1. And then you've got your, you know, your seven days. And... The Lord comes right at the time of his birthday, and that begins the 50 days. Well, there's a lot of issues. Is this one a possibility? Yes. Next year, I will grant this. And as we get closer, I'll talk about it more. It is a possibility, but do I believe it is? Not really. But we will definitely be on high watch. But why don't I believe it is? Well, because for one, we've learned what it means that when the sickle is put to the corn, it's talking about wheat. And the winter wheat harvest begins at this time. It begins about mid-Taurus every year. Right as barley starts coming to an end, a little bit of overlap, the time of the wheat harvest begins. Okay? All in this time frame. Every year. That's why when it's harvested by hand and it's all done, it's done at around this time and the bread is ready and they can bake bread, grind it. You can't do that with spring wheat. We broke that down in recent videos. OK, but now here's the problem. <clears throat> this then would be the escape. You see, wheat or winter wheat that that would be harvested, this would only be right around the beginning of the harvest. And in the law, this at the beginning of the wheat harvest is not when the bread, the, the grains can be crushed and the flour for the bread made. It's not until the end of the wheat harvest. And the end of the wheat harvest is down here. Hello. So if this is where the connection is to the escape, because that's when the two loaves can be brought in, then this begins the 50 days. And why is this more important? Why is this the greater picture? Because it's attack one on the fifth month, fasting and mourning. Attack two on the seventh month, fasting and mourning. It's when the actual wheat from winter wheat is turned into loaves of bread with leaven. This is actually the 50th day of true Pentecost, which is where actual wine from in September to early October, when actual wine is harvested and new wine is made, just like it said in Pentecost. But there's another reason. It's beyond just understanding the time of his birth. It's the rest of the story in Isaiah. When you go to the, the story in Isaiah 9, we've talked about this recently, and it's so awesome to catch. We understood that that story in Matthew chapter 4 is from the was in Isaiah, the is fulfilled when he was here the first time, and listen to what it says. <clears throat> and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is on the, on, on the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, then it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, "The land of, Ze uh, of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the sea and by the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles." 
And what does it say? The people which sat in darkness saw a great light. Oh, my goodness, there it is again. Jesus fulfilled this in the is. But was it his birthday like the way it would appear to tell us in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born? Was this his birthday? No. How do we know it wasn't his birthday, but it was kind of near? Because we find out right here. This was awesome when I caught it. In verse 12, now when Jesus heard that John was in prison, that's when he departed to those places. We know from history that John was still around after Christ's baptism, which was right around his birthday, just like Luke chapter uh, 3 says. We know it was the time of his birthday. Jesus had just begun to turn 30 <coughs> when he was baptized. And this, and we know that John was still around. Jesus had the 40 days. He, he was then going about. We saw in, uh, in John chapter 3, John was gone baptizing. And others and those that were with him, his disciples with John, were baptizing. And they came, two of them, and said, hey, that, that guy that you said over there, he's over with some other guys baptizing over here. We know it's about two months. And the history books told us that it was about two months before John was taken and put in prison. Which means if Jesus got baptized right around his birthday and John was in prison about two months later, that means it's really not a picture of Jesus coming exactly on his birthday. It's about two months later. So what's two months from the 15th of Savan? The 15th, 16th, just like right here. So instead of his 40 days beginning where we would think right around his birthday, <clears throat> it tells us in chapter four that when he comes, it's about two months after his birthday. Head explosion. When I saw when I caught that one just a couple of three months ago, <clears throat> it blew my mind. And it only took one day because when this time had passed, and I was frustrated saying, Lord, but it doesn't make any sense. We see Isaiah, we see Luke too. We know it's connected to his birthday. The following day, in the shower, as you guys know the story, is when I get revelations and bang, it hit me. I went back to read Matthew chapter four, where it said he fulfilled Isaiah nine in the is. And I went back and I saw that verse and I said, oh, my goodness, because three years later or earlier, we were literally teaching on the story of John that it was about two months before he was in prison and then was in prison for 10 months before he was beheaded. Two months later, there it is. What is this picture? From the time of the wheat, the beginning of the four of the of the 50 days, there's the eighth day after the wedding. You have your fifth month, you have your seventh month, you have your first attack. And what's the attack from Syria? The scriptures literally, as we showed in Second Chronicles 24, said at the year's end. Right there. Right there. It's incredible stuff, guys. Let me show you this piece from this uh, this writing on the teacher of righteousness. I want you to check this out. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. There's one specific place on this part that I want to share with you guys. <coughs> this part right here. So as the guy continues, it says the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls were part of a library, a simple fact that is easy to, to ignore, but it means that there is not one, sing not one single messiological messianology mess messianology <laughs> to be found in the text from Qumran instead we must accept that there are several theories about the messiah remember i was telling you pay attention how everything was was light and darkness right so he came and comes and shines his light in the darkness and the light sprung up and i mean it's everywhere that we see in the prophetic picture, when he comes to start his 40 days, when he comes to start his 40 days, who is he coming as? Jonah. Remember, he's coming as Jonah. He's coming as, as a prophetic picture of Jonah the prophet to warn of Jerusalem that's going to be compassed about, <coughs> excuse me, and destroyed. Okay? Now listen to what this says. 
in the war scroll. The Messiah is a prophet and takes no part in the war. Listen to this between the children of light and the children of darkness. You see that? It's even in the same scrolls. It's in these Dead Sea Scrolls in the connection to the teacher of righteousness who would reveal and understand these things. But these guys can't understand it. They know there's two messiahs coming. We know, excuse me, we know where the two messiahs are coming. We know that there are two witnesses. One is the high priest and king. The other one is the Davidic branch, the line. One is messiah. At the end of seals, one is the modern day Zerubbabel, who was here, who will re, who will lay the foundation during the time of seals, and he will be the one to build it. That's what it's talking about. This is what Jews talk about when they're talking about two messiahs to come. One is truly the Messiah, the high priest and king, the the Zerubbab uh, uh, the the Melchizedek, and Zerubbabel is the other one. The Melchizedek high priest is the greater authority, of course. We're going to cover that a little bit later. But you see, they can't understand how in the war scroll there's a Messiah prophet who takes no part in war between the children of light and the children of darkness. When is the time of the children of light? When he comes to spread his light as a prophet as Jonah did during 40 days to bring light to who? The Mark group, just like we got here. This is the group of light from creation. When Christ was made light in verse 3 of Genesis 1 and the days of the year of, of creation began. He was light and they were made light. They were made in his image, in their image. They were light. They were light beings at that point. Who is this representing? This represents the house of Israel and the world, the Gentiles that are grafted in. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to shed his light to them. And this group is going to be anointed with that light. To shed the light and to spread the light during the time of seals, that worker remnant worker bride portion, as as our sister's website talks about. And as we share often. The remnant worker bride. That historically were called 14thers. That now, I believe, are called 14ers. All of them? No, don't panic. There's no need to panic. Some believe they understand they're going to be here during the time of seals with the Lord. During the 40 days and then working during seals. I'm, I'm believing that I am now too. And if you read about the teacher of righteousness, you'll get it. We're going to touch on that part because I'm going to show another part in relation to the end of seals. Okay? So there's going to be a group that's with them for 40 days that will remain during seals the, at the very least. Maybe some go further, but they are his remnant worker bride spreading his light of salvation. This is why it's so fascinating. Why can't he why can't they understand that there's a Messiah prophet that takes no war that takes no part in war between the children of light and the children of darkness. Because, you know, they, they're expecting a Messiah to come war. They know there's two Messiahs that we're going to talk on in a little bit as we connect these things further in. <clears throat> Why? Because they don't know that there's a Messiah coming for 40 days yet. That he's coming as Elijah, I mean, as Jonah. That he's coming to shed his light. That he's not coming to war between them. He's coming to warn. He's not coming to war until he comes as high priest and king Melchizedek at the end of seals. At the end of the sixth year of seals in the Ezekiel 39 war. You know why they can't understand this? Because like everybody else, they're only seeing seven years. You'll see this unfold as we go further into this as well. It's just, it's so incredible. It's in the Qumran scrolls. 
when he sheds his light on the children of darkness. And he's got the children of light who are going to help shed light on the children of darkness. And he's not coming to war because he's the prophet Jonah typology. Coming to warn. Crazy awesome stuff. Okay, let's go now to 34, about 15. Are people? Yes, like they did to Galad Shalit, they will also do that. They will kidnap people and torture them and things like that. For now, what I also saw is that the Mount of Olives next to Jerusalem, for those who are saved, that mountain will split in two. And when the mountain splits that very second, the Messiah will be revealed to everyone. Everyone will just see that it's the Messiah. We will know it's the Messiah. Here he is, revealed to everyone. He will stand at the entrance of the Mount of Olives, and he will say who can enter and who cannot enter. Anyone who is not saved will stay outside and die. And anyone who is worthy will be saved. You have to know what he will be saved from. So the mountain just opens, and also... Now it opens, it opens? It splits in two. Something like... No, no. An earthquake? No. A nuclear bomb? What? No, they will rise up. You know how on the Mount of Olives there are graves? Listen right? to this. So two of the dead people will walk out. Two dead people will come back to life. One from here... <laughs> two dead people... Two dead people... Will walk out... From the splitting... Of... The Mount of Olives. Two dead people. Isn't that precisely where we put the two witnesses? Two dead people will come out. Listen to what he says next. Anyone who is not saved will stay outside and die. And anyone who is worthy will be saved. You have to know what he will be saved from. So the mountain just opens, and also... Now it opens, it opens? It splits in two. Something like... No, no. An earthquake? No. A nuclear bomb? What? No, they will rise up. You know how on the Mount of Olives there are graves, right? So two of the dead people will walk out. Two dead people will come back to life. One from here and one from there. It will split in two. One from here, one from there. One from here, one from there. The two witnesses, exactly as we reveal in the ministry... The two witnesses that we see and we know are killed after the 1260 days of their ministry. They're not killed right away, remember? They complete their 1260 days, which is the first half of trumpets. And when the two when those the mid trumpets time frame is over, then the beast who was killed in the Ezekiel 39 war and those 10 kings and so forth he comes back because Satan's cast down and the pit is opened. When the pit is opened, Antichrist comes back. That's why in Revelation 16, you see all three. Yet at the end of the sixth year of seals in the Ezekiel 39 war, he's killed. It's, it's the answer to Revelation chapter 17. The beast that was, is not, and shall be. <clears throat> For those that are newer, let me show it on the timeline. Two and a half years of World War III, approximately. He has his 42 months or three and a half years, which is to the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of six years of tribulation, the first six years of seals and tribulation. Then what happens? The Lord's coming. Oh, my goodness, the wrath of the Lamb has come. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the great wrath of the Lamb, for the day of his wrath has come. When is the day of the wrath of the Lamb? It's the end of the six years of seals time frame, the Ezekiel 39 war. And what do we read about it? It's right here. It's in Revelation. Look at this. Listen to what it says about it. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which deceive, uh, uh, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb. This isn't, this isn't the war of the wrath of Almighty God. This is the war for the wrath of the Lamb. And who is he fighting against? The beast and the ten kings, those nations all coming against. What's this an exact picture of? I have a, a short video that either came out in the last couple days or is coming out tomorrow. That talks about this. It's the picture of Daniel chapter 2. The Ezekiel, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the Nebuchadnezzar dream. You have the statue of 
of from the head to the body to the legs, and then you've got the ten toes. And when the ten toes, he explains the ten toes, then he sees a stone carved without hand, thrown and crushing and breaking the toes and crushing and destroying the image. And that stone becomes a great mountain. Well, for one, what is that great mountain that was a stone that became a great mountain? And what were the ten toes? You think there may be the prophetic picture of the ten horns? What's the overall picture of that image? Do you think maybe it's the beast? Remember Revelation 17? There's ten horns. Uh, sorry, Revelation 13. What is he has ten horns, right? So the beast has the ten horns, those ten kings. He also has what? In the picture of the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the ten toes represent the ten the ten kings or the ten horns that he gets later in, in the in the time of seals tribulation. But the image itself represents what? The lion, the bear, and the leopard. It's a picture of the lion, the leopard, and the ten kings. That's the picture we're getting. And the beast is what? So a beast is the the beast is the image. Isn't that what Revelation 13 says? He is the image. He is the prophetic image of that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And you see that the lion has his time first, then the bear has his time, then the, the, the leopard has his portion. The beast comes, takes the power, and is all of them at once, then has the ten kings as ten horns, completes the image, and at the end of seals, when it's the time of the wrath of the lamb, like the end of the sixth seal, we read the time of the wrath of the lamb. There they are. All right there. And what does he do? He kills them. What do we know? What do we know in Reve in uh, Daniel 7? That the beast is killed. That the beast is killed, but the Antichrist isn't. Uh, sorry, but the false prophet isn't. Right? The beast is killed in these 10 kings and, and many warriors in, in that battle. But the, the, the false prophet isn't. He flees and he stays away. So what do we see? We're seeing the beast being killed at the end of six years of seals. So he was for the second half of seals approximately. He is not for the first half of trumpets. And then he shall be in Revelation 11 when Satan is cast down and the pit is opened. And then what is he going to do? He's going to make war against the two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? Well, we just saw in the Teacher of Righteousness writing that they're the two messiahs. Who are the two messiahs? They're the high priest and king Melchizedek, the highest one of all, who has the greatest authority. And the, 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 from the line of King David, the, the, um, the Davidic line, the branch, who's called Zerubbabel, the one who's rebuilding, who's in charge, who laid the foundation during seals. And what happens to them? They get killed at the end of the sixth year of seals, right near the end of it. Here's the end of the sixth, or sorry, not seals, the sixth year of trumpets. This is the end of the 13 years of tribulation, which means this war that he has against them is going to last two and a half years. And that's precisely what Revelation, uh, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 12 told us that would be for a time, times and a half. There's no end between time and times because it's one, two and a half. And what is that final year? That's the wrath of the Lord God at the treading of the grapes. Okay, so he's telling us that there was one from here and one from there. Who are they? Well, we know this from Zechariah as well. All right, Zechariah, there you go, the two olive trees. Right, what do we know about it? It's Zerubbabel. And where is it? Zerubbabel is the one that laid the foundation. You see, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. He's the one in charge of laying the foundation, which means whoever this modern day Zerubbabel person will be in the end of days, he's already here. 
He's going to be very well known already, probably somewhat a global scale, because it even says the definition for Zerubbabel, is it in Hebrew? Yeah. Is that he's from Babylon because he was born there. He's from Babylon because he was born there, but he's a Jew. Okay, he's Jewish. And he's the one heading the laying of the foundation. And what does it say? We find out that the two olive trees and the two branches, okay, to the two anointed ones. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 6. It tells us who they are. It says in Zechariah 6 verse 11, take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them on the head of Joshua. Who is Joshua? Jesus, of course. Yeshua. He's a prophetic picture of Jesus when he comes at the end of seals. And what is he going to be? The high priest. The high priest is the one that has the greater authority. And who is the branch? The branch is the one that laid the foundation because we were told that the one who laid the foundation is the one that's going to complete it. See? And he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who? The branch. Zerubbabel. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. This is why <clears throat> the Jews talk about two messiahs. There's the high priest Melchizedek, who is going to be Jesus, and the other one is Zerubbabel, who oversees the rebuilding of the temple, who is the one who is here, and then there's what? There's one from here, and one from there. One from the earth and one from above. One is Christ, high priest and king, who's going to destroy the enemies of Israel and Jerusalem at the end of the sixth year of seals in the Ezekiel 39 war. And the other one is going to be the one to rebuild the temple on the foundation that he built during seals after Jerusalem had been destroyed. This Look at what we read. <clears throat> in Psalms 110, Right here. And the Lord said unto my Lord, so the Father said unto Jesus, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool, and the Lord shall send out the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Who is he? Verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. The Lord, lowercase, this is Jesus, at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. That's Revelation 17, the wrath of the Lamb. That's the end of the sixth year of seals in Revelation chapter 6. We can show again in the chapters to years, when you go to Hebrews, it has the 13 years. It's a picture of going to the end of the 13th year of tribulation. So here's your seventh year, and look at what it says. It's now talking about the order of Melchizedek, the high priest and king. He, he's greater than, than Aaron. What further need in Hebrews 11, uh, 7, verse 11, halfway through, what further need, what further need was there of another priest, uh, was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay? So there's this, this Aaron line, but Jesus as the high priest Melchizedek is the one who is greater than Aaron, of course. And he is greater and above the Zerubbabel, even though they're ruling between them both. They are the two witnesses. And he saw that when the, when the Mount of Olives opened, Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives. The Lord stood on the Mount of Olives. But one was from here, one was from there. That's what the kid said. We just saw in Psalms 110, the Melchizedek connection as high priest and king. And we saw that it's, it's Joshua or Yeshua. And he was told to sit at his right hand. Well, isn't that fascinating? If you go to the Synoptic Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, this is something I recently shared in a short as well. <clears throat> when you understand the differences, Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew's post, or the 40 days of the Son of Man. In the, in the last chapter, right? Remember the resurrection story? 40 days of the Son of Man typology? 
end of six years of seals typology, end of six years of trumpets typology, which means at the end of Mark's gospel, the reason for the difference in the wording in the Great Commission is because it's a picture of the end of six years of seals. And listen to what it says. So after the, the, the Lord had spoken, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Only here do you read that he sat on the right hand of God in relation to the, the synoptic gospels and their differences. Why? Because this is precisely where it happens at the end of the six years of seals at the Ezekiel 39 war when he then becomes high priest and king. And what does it say? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. <clears throat> what, are, what does it mean, these signs following and working with them? Well, because he's now, he came on what? Remember that stone carved without hand that became a great mountain? That doesn't sound like the Mount of Olives, does it? Because it's not. It's when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared, paradise, where he's going to receive the great multitude rapture group in the seventh year of seals. That's why when trumpets begins, if you go to the 14 chapters as years to Zechariah, you go to Zechariah chapter 8, and you see the Lord, who was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy, is no longer jealous as he was at the beginning. It says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord <clears throat> of hosts, the holy mountain. This is Mount Zion. Heavenly Mount Zion that came down. And what are they going to do? Just as we've taught for a long time, there was during the time of seals when the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid that now the temple can be built. It's the beginning of trumpets. And why couldn't they build it before the temple? Because there was no peace. Because the Lord came, uh, there was no peace to them that went out or came in because of the affliction. And the Lord even tells you, for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. What is that? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people against people. When? When he gave the sword at the red horse rider, when the attack began on Jerusalem and World War III broke out, just like the kid said. No peace. Until the end of the sixth seal and the destruction of the Ezekiel 39 war. And the high priest and king Melchizedek and Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, is now going to be the one to complete it or the, the head completing it. I'm telling you guys, this is so, it's so beautiful. Seeing and understanding these things and breaking these things down. <clears throat> Watch this. Let's go back to the teacher of righteousness. Let me go back up one. Watch this. Let me just find that place. I think it's right here. Okay, listen to this. So here, two messiahs emerge in the end of days, okay? This is also, again, all this connection to the uh, teacher of righteousness and the understanding that would be revealed to him in the end of days. And the two messiahs coming, okay? The interpreter of the law. So the the... The uh, uh, teacher of righteousness has many names. One is the interpreter of the law, which means the interpreter of scriptures, right? The understanding of in, in the prophet, in the prophetic, I mean. It says, now listen to this. So there's two messiahs that emerge in the end of days, uh, or high priest messiah and prince, okay? So here two high priests emerge in the end of days, okay? In the interpreter, uh, the interpreter of the law. So the interpreter of the law is revealing that there's, Two messiahs that are coming. One is the messiah priest, and the other one is the prince of the whole congregation. The priest messiah, the high priest and king, this is the Melchizedek. This is Jesus. And the prince of the whole congregation, this one is the Zerubbabel, the Davidic messiah. Okay, The one that the Jews are waiting for who's going to be the one rebuilding their temple. And they're waiting for... This other one who they know is going to what? You see, this is why the Christians have been mixed up. And I talk about this in the video. It's all because of Matthew. You see, because everybody learns from Matthew, they only think seven years. And all their focus is from the Gospels written to the Jews, which is, which is Matthew. So they've missed half the story. And so did these guys as they're reading it. 
because they don't understand where these things fall because they only see seven years. And when people only see seven years, what do they think comes first? They think the two witnesses are coming first and the temple is going to be rebuilt. Hello. Who are the two witnesses? The two messiahs. Antichrist is not rebuilding the temple. Antichrist, when he's resurrected and the Satan is here and the false prophet, they're going to go and defile the temple that was rebuilt by one of the messiahs, which is the, the prince uh, Davidic one who's rebuilding the, 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 the Zerubbabel one. Jesus is the high priest and king messiah who has the greater authority. And the reason says then in, in Mark, at the end of Mark, says that he's now and he's following them is because at the end of Mark, he's talking to the 144,000 who have now been sealed and are standing on Mount Zion in Revelation 14 with them. And they're now going to go out and do their preaching. And no deadly thing will hurt them. Why? Because when the pit opens, deadly things are coming. And they won't be hurt by these things. You see? Let's keep going. These figures are also referred to through the DSS, which is, this is the uh, Damascus documents, as the messiahs of Aaron and Israel, okay? We just saw this connection to the high priest of Aaron, but he's greater than Aaron. He's actually the Melchizedek Aaron, okay? Greater than Aaron. They are not equal, uh, they are not equal counterparts. The priest messiah has precedent, precedence over the Davidic Messiah in all legal matters. As they teach him, so shall he judge. Okay? So as the high priest Messiah Yeshua Jesus is has precedence over the Davidic Messiah, the Davidic Messiah is going to learn from the priestly Messiah to rightly judge. The precedence can be seen in passages from the community rule when the table has been prepared for eating and the new wine for drinking, the priest shall get the first fruits of the bread uh, and of the wine. So I believe that what that's a picture of is the first fruit remnant bride workers. Remember, they remain to work. So now they're the first fruits that are receiving the blessing and the new wine who, is, who are the 144,000 picture, the first fruits of new wine that are going to be going out. They're now going to be having some special celebration some special observance. It says, here the Messiah of Aaron takes precedence because he is the eschatological high priest who teaches righteousness at the end of days. Now listen to this. Although the prince of the congregation presides over the battle liturgical and the eschatological banquet, the Messiah Aaron is more important for understanding the teacher of righteousness. The Messiah High Priest, Melchizedek, is the one that's also more important to understand, to understanding the teacher of righteousness, because he is the one who continues the teacher's message. What? Mind explosion. The arrival of the Messiah's Aaron and Israel marks the eschatological turning point. Once they arrive, the Messiah Aaron interprets the law. His legacy in the community is the basic interpretation of the law in, uh, uh, that functions at the end of days. Now, I want you to understand something. You see, this is what I was showing you, and this is why I was showing you. Because when we came down here, we saw that they couldn't understand why there was a Messiah prophet that didn't engage in any war. Because we can show that that is the 40 days Messiah, son of man coming. But there is another that comes, which is Messiah when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, that, that stone carved without hands that becomes a great mountain. He is Messiah high priest. But according to these guys, because they don't understand the 14 years, they don't see those first seven, just like the church world doesn't see the first seven. So what do they think comes first? The two witnesses. So what is this guy saying? He believes that when these two witnesses come out, come in, he'll you read this, and he believes that what it's saying 
is that the teacher of righteousness, this 14ers connection, 14ers group, that they won't take part in the tribulation. Because according to his understanding, which he doesn't fully have, he believes it doesn't start till the arrival of the two messiahs. That's not the case. This has told me today that the 14thers who will be chosen, not all, some are simply being prepared and rewarded with understanding for diligently seeking. They're thirsty for more to understand what the Lord is revealing in his word. To be prepared for that pre-trib escape. Some will be going. But there's going to be a group remaining. And this group remaining. According to the writings. From the teacher of righteousness. Speaking about the future teacher of righteousness. Preparing a people for the end of days. In the revelation of the prophets and of the word. Is going to be here. Until the two messiahs show up. When do they show up? We've already told you. At the end of the sixth year of seals. Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, high priest and king. And Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel will be here through the story. But the high priest and king. Melchizedek. Won't come until the end of the sixth seal. When he comes as that stone carved without hand. When he comes in the wrath of the Lamb, as the high priest and king, and will take over, and and, and is going to continue from the revelation that was revealed, even though he already has it, of course, because it's his word, is going to continue to essentially prove out the revelation that was given from the Lord God about the high priest and king, Yeshua Messiah, about his end of days? Through the spirit living within him? Talk about a mind melt. This, this write-up is absolutely bonkers. And it speaks to us, brothers and sisters. This is why I'm trying to tell you. When you understand... When it really gets into your heart, when it really gets into your spirit, the revelation of everything that has come for six years and, and with every part that's been proven or shown or revealed, we've been able to prove it from dozens of other places in Scripture. Proving it out to be true over and over and over and over again giving us greater and greater and greater clarity through the revelation of the prophets, the Psalms, the creation, the, the, the Gospels, the, 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 the book of Revelation. This is why we keep digging. We don't just say, oh, we know it now. Oh, good luck. No. It's never going to end until it's our time to go or our time to remain. We are being prepared either to be taken or to remain and work. Like I said, that's the story of what's been taking place here in this ministry. Preparing a remnant worker bride who were prophetically or, or historically the church of Smyrna, who are prophetically the is to come church of Smyrna. Disciple workers of Christ when he returns from the wedding. Who will be here. Until the Lord comes as high priest and king. And will take over from the one leading. As the teacher of righteousness. I, I really want you to understand this for those that are grasping some of it. And, and the reason I want you to grasp it. Is many fold. But. To, to know that what, you under, what you've understood isn't for no reason. And for those that are really understanding it, most of them are prepared. 
one way or the other. But it won't be a mystery, guys, even though you may not know now for sure. There will come a day right before the pre-trib escape, like we've shown in Luke chapter uh, 12. There will come a day right before the pre-trib escape where he will inform all those who are remaining to wait for him when he returns from the wedding. He's going to let them know. And do you know what happens when he returns from the wedding and we have a banquet with him? Our understanding will be opened. So those of you who were maybe getting it and, and understanding but weren't fully, he will complete the story in us. What story? The revelation he's been preparing us in. This is no joke. There's a reason why people come against us and don't understand it. It's not for all of them. The Lord is preparing the people. And we don't have them all yet, by the way, because the time is not yet. We have a few more months to go. We may lose some. We have, may have more come in. But when the time is ready, I'll guarantee you, everybody who's supposed to know will know. Because everything happens at his purposed and planned time without fail, brothers and sisters. You see, so you're seeing, we saw that two came out. And we know that these two messiahs are the two witnesses. They're there during the first half of trumpets while the rebuilding is taking place. Well, one leads as high priest leads the 144,000 who he's anointing with their powers, with even greater powers than the ones during seals had. Why? Well, because they're going to be during a time when the Antichrist comes. I mean, when, when uh, the Antichrist comes back and Satan is cast down and the pit is open and all these things come out of the pit. We read in Mark's discourse that when, when the Antichrist gets his power and it's time to flee in the time of the Mark and everything else, it's going to be worse than it ever was up to that point in all of human history. But do you know what it says is Matthew's? When it comes to the time of Matthew's abomination, that's when the pit is open. And the abomination that takes place in Messiah, the two witnesses are cut off, and there's a war that breaks out against them for two, two and a half years. During the two and a half of the final three and a half years of trumpets. And in this war, that last two and a half years, that is the abomination at the beginning when the pit is open. And, and what do we read about it? Well, we read in Revelation chapter 17 again. We read as what I was talking about earlier. The one, the beast that was, is not, and shall be. When does he shall be? When he ascends out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. So he's going into perdition. He's coming out of the bottomless pit and going into perdition. At the midpoint of trumpets, about 10 and a half years in, or in the 11th year, which is when the temple will have been complete. This is the time of, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The son of perdition, when he'll go in and declare himself. And then a war will break out against the two witnesses for two and a half years. Until what? Until those two and a half years are done. The two witnesses are killed. And what did the boy say? They end up coming out of the Mount of Olives. Where is this picture of the Mount of Olives? At the beginning of chapter 14, like the beginning of the 14th year. They're dead three and a half days. They go up to heaven and what? Oof, th this prophetic picture. And what happens? It's the final battle. Which battle is this? This is the battle of the grapes. Here's the cleaving in two. One comes out. One, uh, they both come out. One from here, one from there. Zerubbabel and the Lord. And it's now the what? The day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, which is something we've been talking about a lot lately, which is, what we've shared a number of times in Jeremiah chapter 25, which is when the 70 years in Jerusalem are accomplished. When does that happen? Well, 
It just so happens we can show it exactly. Everybody can. It's right here. 1967, when they finally got the other half of Jerusalem and the 70 years ends at the Feast of Trumpets or the day before, Feast of Trumpets 2037. And look at what it happens to be. The end of the 13 years. Right at the end, when the two witnesses have been killed, the Mount of Olives then splits, one from there, one from here, excuse me, one from there, one from here, and it's now the what? The wrath of the Lord God. 70 years are accomplished, and he's now going to go after all of those who came against, destroy them all, and what does he call it? The time of the treading of the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Well, isn't that amazing? Because in Revelation 11, at the seventh trumpet, which is the seventh year of tribulation, uh, uh, sorry, the seventh year of trumpets or the 14th year of tribulation, verse 17 of Revelation 11 says, saying that we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, which are to come. And what's the time? It's now the time of his wrath. Where do we find that wrath? You got it, Revelation 19. Revelation 19, we now see the wrath of the Lord God, his vestiture dipped in blood. He has now a sword that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he that treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Are you following it? Do you see the picture? I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we have understood. We have understood. Now listen to what he tells us here. Who kept the seven laws of Noah and the Jews who observed the Torah and good deeds and all. And that will only be the beginning. What will happen is just like... So wait, wait, Nathan, go. slowly, slowly. We have Gog and Magog, which has already begun. Yes, it's already begun. We have the downfall. They conquer us and get Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives splits. Yes. Whoever enters the Mount of Olives, that essentially protects him. Yes. It protects him and then God appears and he is the one who fights the Gentiles. Yes. You say that he comes wearing a white robe with bloodstains. And those bloodstains are in fact the bloodstains of all the Jews who were killed only because they were Jews over all the generations. Yes. The destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, the Inquisition. There. Here, did you hear that? What does he come with? He comes with a white robe that had bloodstains on it. Well, isn't that exactly what we read? Do you think this kid knew the book of Revelation? And he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. <laughs> when is this, guys? This is Zechariah 14. When, when the, it splits in two, one from here, one from there, and he stands there. It's, it's, it's the same one. He comes with his vestiture dipped in blood. There is no lack. No lack. And now God avenges them and just wipes them out. He wipes them out. And he makes a grave for Obama there. In Israel. In Israel. Here in Israel, yes. Okay, now what's the next phase? The next phase, the redemption will begin, but it will only be in the beginning. It will take time until everything begins. First of all, there will be lots and lots of bodies, and it will take time, a long time until they remove all the bodies. That light that I told you was up there, it will descend. It will be brought down, and that will be our light, like we can see light now. There, did you see that? <clears throat> so there's going to be a whole bunch of bodies, but... Did you hear what he said? He said, then there will be that light, this light that descends down, and that light will be there and will always be there, but like we have light now. You want to see what that is? You guys know what that is, right? We've showed it the great wine press of the wrath of God this time of the final year. What do we know about this final year? Okay, Let me, let's go back into Jeremiah real quick. Jeremiah 25. Yeah, I think, yeah, we just covered that. 30 through 33. Okay. There he is. We'll plead with all flesh. Okay. Treading of the wine grapes. And what does it say? Uh, rise up from the coast, from nation to nation. And in verse 33, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end. What do we know about this light? Well, let me show you all the places we've shown and explained this light when the Lord comes and it's the splitting of the Mount of Olives. It's the final year. He becomes that light. What is this light, brothers and sisters? You guys all know it very well as I bring this to an end. Right here. Luke 17, 24. They're asking him about the end of days and what will it be like? And he says, for as lightning that lighteth under one part of heaven 
and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Here's the part that I was talking to you from when it all begins, when he comes in Luke 21, when he comes as, as uh, Jonah for 40 days, in Luke chapter 21, when it said, but before all these, this is what he jumps in with next. So he tells them what it'll be like when he comes in his day, which is as lightning, which is the light that the kid is seeing at the splitting. And the, and the two, one from above, come out, one from above, one from here. And the Lord is there standing on the side of the Mount of Olives that's now split. And it's a great light. This great light has come. And what do we see? <clears throat> we see it right here. And then he goes on to say, but it's all going to start like this. So he starts by telling them the end. And what else do we know about this end? Well, if it's the end, what if we go to Matthew Chapter 24, and what do we know about Matthew 24? In Matthew 24, when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, right here, what does it say in 24, 29? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. You'll have some people try to tell you that this is pre-trib. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Do you know what Mark says? Immediately after that tribulation. Because that's after the tribulation of the six years of seals. This one is at the end of 13 years of tribulation or after the end of the six years, immediately after the tribulation of those six years of trumpets. <coughs> this is when he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. And listen to what it says in verse 24. Uh, sorry, Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hello. Do you know you don't read this in any of the other discourses? This is him coming at the end of 13 years or at the start of the 14th year. This is Zechariah 14. It's the same thing. What if we go to Matthew 28, which is a picture of what? What did I say the, resurrection, the resurrections were? Luke's was a picture of the start of his 40 days, prophetic typology. What was Mark's? It was the end of the six years of seals. What is Matthew's? The end of the six years of trumpets or the end of the 13th year. And what do we read? Verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Do you know that it's only this description in Matthew's? Just like Matthew 24, it's only described there. Luke 17 tells you when it's going to be in his day. And then he goes and starts with Luke and then goes to Mark. And then it would go to this is when I come in my day, but these things are coming first. That's what he's saying. And he just said, and you saw him, he sees him come like light. And he is going to be that light. It's awesome. So, so awesome. Now, let me bring it to an end with a few pieces that he talks about to, to strengthen you, to help prepare you, to remind us. Oops. Hold on a second. Specific place to start. There we go. Listen to this. We talked about this a few times. I've even said this is this is my most despised word. Cause suffering in heaven. Yes, quite a lot. Really, every sin causes anguish in heaven. Every sin is different. Every sin has its own punishment. Everyone. You do such and such sin, such details, but it's very bad. And there are sins that are worse, that have bigger punishment. For instance, pride. Pride is a very, very, very big sin. Pride. And if a person speaks... Pride is a very, very big sin. So he, they're asking him about what sins, you know, is there different levels of sins? And he explains that there are different levels of sin in heaven that have greater punishments and so forth. He, he does go to explain that there is repentance. And in repentance, when you go to heaven, he says none of those sins that were repented of were remembered or even brought up. But the sins that weren't repented of, they were reminded and they were judged on when they got when he got to heaven. And he explains when they ask all of, you know, these sins and their levels of sins. The first thing he talks about is pride, is pride. Is it any wonder why the, the gay community has the name for pride? Any wonder? 
it happens in everything, guys. Just like, you know, the, for example, the alphabet. Why? Aleph bet, the first two Hebrew letters. Aleph bet, we get the alphabet. It's everywhere. It's everything throughout the world is connected to the truth, to the Lord. It's connected to, to the mysteries of things hidden behind it that we can't see. It's all playing out. Let's go a little bit further. He talks about uh, a lot of other sins too. And you can always go to the video and listen to it. Yes. The army doesn't interest them? They don't care. The flag, Independence Day? Nope. No, very good. And I saw lots of people who were very great on Earth. Presidents, heads of armies, and all those kind of people up there. You don't know what it's like for them up there. You don't know. That means small and big are there. The one who decides who is small and who is big, it's only there. Here on Earth, someone can be a huge big shot, but up there, he's an average Joe. Yes. Also, who you are on Earth means nothing, but only in the next life. Your status in this world means nothing. It doesn't matter what's going on with you. Even if you have money, you won't be able to use it because you won't have money, because you will go up there. This whole life, everything you do here is one big test. Your whole life, every single second in your life that passes is a test. Everything is a test. People ask why God created the world. Why did God create the world? Because based on what I knew, the character of God is to do good, to do good for his creation. So that is why he brought us down to this world, to make things good for us, so we can keep the commandments, so we will get what is ours. See that? Everything here is a test. He understood from up there that everything on earth, none of this stuff on earth mattered. It was a test in coming to him, in being obedient, in drawing closer. Are there things we have to get done? Like we say in this ministry, yeah, things have to get done. We got to do things. We got to reach more people. We got to do what we can. Pray for, support, uplift, strengthen, share. We have to do all these things, but we're doing them in Christ. That's the point. Everything else is nothing. Everything else is nothing. Everything is a test. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Got two more little ones that I want to show. And, and it's like things that we've been talking about before as well. Very important things. Forbidden. What? That thing called Gog and Magog, that war. All of Israel must repent and unite. I also knew that the reason God does this, if you notice, every time there was a terror attack in Israel, when a lot of people die and all, suddenly the whole nation comes together. Everyone is sad. Everyone. You know that God does these bad things in order to wake us up. Sooner or later, he will bring this big thing down on us so that everyone will repent. Like, everyone. Because the instant something happens to someone from Israel, everyone unites. He does things like this all the time. Things like this. But nobody knows that it's a sign from heaven. So he's bringing something huge, huge, gigantic, so that everyone will repent. So that everyone will unite. So yes, we need to unite. See that? Just like we've been saying, guys. The Lord is doing this on purpose. Of course he is. Why is he allowing it? To wake people up. Remember how we used to say a lot, just like 9-11? 9-11 happens, and the all of America and different people from around the world, but especially in America, the churches were full for about six weeks. So something devastating happens. <clears throat> they all come together. The churches were packed. It lasted about six weeks. Then there started to be room. You see? Well, then what happens? It's going to take something bigger than an attack like 9-11, won't it? Of course it will. It's going to be so big that everybody will start crying out to him. And what do we know begins in the end of days? The greatest revival in human history will begin after the pre-trib escape and the first attack on Israel. It'll be the time of the, of the Ephesus, the time of the apostles, and it will begin the greatest revival in human history. Because the end has begun, and tens of millions of people will have vanished, and chaos will begin. One last one, a little bit further. He breaks this down just a little bit more, and then we are done. All right, let's check this out. Come on, let's start here. God's help, he will be on his way. He is on his way to the Jewish school. Let me also say that. Someone who suffers here, a question. Yes, I have an answer for this. These are people who repent. For example, there are people who repent and then suffer a lot. So the question is, why does he suffer if he repented? And it could be that there are people, for example, even a Jew, the most evil Jew, like he's a Jew. For sure he did a good deed or two in his life. For sure he stopped when someone asked, come help me with this. For sure he was in a synagogue once with his son for his good deed. For sure every single person has done something good. For every good deed must be rewarded. So God for the evil ones, he says to them, okay, you deserve a reward for this. And then he gives them their reward on earth. He gives them houses, cars, everything. All the good things that you can imagine. But in the next world, they get the biggest slap in the face of their lives. But people who repent, they still deserve punishment for their sins. So what happens? The suffering. They get their suffering here. Here at the hospital, a little here, a little there. But in the world to come, they get all the goodness there is. Did you hear that? That was so wise, in my opinion. Did you hear what he just said? 
what what what's this to, what are we to understand about suffering what's the issue with all this suffering and he says i understood it when i was there <clears throat> he said just in case you guys didn't hear it clearly he said that even wicked people on the earth he says it could even be the most wicked jew because he's talking to his people a, a jewish audience he says it could be the most wicked vile jewish person but everybody in their life has done things worthy of reward, has done good things, has helped somebody cross the street, done some of the gross, has done something good at some point throughout their life. And God rewards these deeds. And so those who don't repent, those deeds still need to be rewarded. So their reward that they're receiving, that's why you got some of these rich people, not all, but some of these rich and the things that you're doing. And we've probably questioned, I know I have throughout my life, why are these guys getting such reward? Look at these things that they're doing. We know it's not honest what they're doing. And they keep getting richer and get, why? Because the Lord is giving them their reward on the earth because when eternity comes for them, it's a slap in the face and they're going to pay for all of their sins. But for those who are in Christ, who are repentant, or in his case, in the Lord, who are repentant, they're receiving some testing punishment <coughs> Excuse me for their sins here. They're going through things on this earth because of sin. So that when they get to heaven, they could receive their rewards and no sin is remembered. Which would you prefer? A little suffering here, like he said, some in the hospital. Maybe you end up here in an accident here. Something happens. You're receiving a, a, a punishment, a, 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 something happening for sin that maybe hasn't been repented of yet. And so you're paying for it here. So that when you get there, you're free of sin and suffering. For the others, it's the opposite. Brothers and sisters, I hope and pray this has blessed you. I was so looking forward. I was so excited to do this video. I It, it, it had so much. It, it covers so much. It reveals and confirms so many things. We have understood. Now we're just growing in the greater detail of these revelations. And I'm looking forward to see what the Lord has for us as he continues to lead us by the Spirit to reveal more and more and more and prepare us and prepare us and prepare us prepare us to be in the third heaven of the lowest room ready to be accounted worthy hopefully right that's what we do luke 21 36 watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man that's the pre-trib luke 14 group going to the third heaven in the lowest room and who's the other group? The other portion is those being prepared to remain that when he knocks and returns from the wedding, they would answer. And what a glorious time it will be for either one. Oh, there's going to be some work for those 14 or workers. But imagine knowing that you have been in the physical presence of the Lord. He opens your understanding. And you're with him as he serves you a meal here on the earth, wherever it might be, for this worker group. You're in the presence of the creator Messiah himself. I don't know how we'll stand. I don't know how we'll function. I don't even know. I mean, we would be blubbering messes. I would be flat out on the ground in tears. No, Lord, we can't be in your presence. Oh. I would think it's going to be something like Daniel. You know, the, Daniel, the, 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 an angel will come and touch your lips so that you can settle down. It would have to be. Because <laughs> I don't know how it would work and otherwise. Because you're going to be walking in his presence for 40 days. Knowing this is the son of man, the Messiah, your Lord and Savior. We'll be ready. I will continue to do my part and prepare everybody that the spirit brings to, to hear it and to receive it. And to seek it and to be diligent in his word. Man, this is so awesome. Man. I can't wait to see why the Lord chose us. Why us? I have no idea. But I will do my part. I hope you guys will continue to do your part and, and seek and search this along the way with me. I can't wait till we meet each other, either in the third heaven, lowest room, or in his presence, ready to serve him, seeing where he'll have us go next. So exciting, guys. We are the final generation. It is near at hand. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. Don't forget, pray for us. Pray for the ministry in Uganda. Pray for each other. Lift each other up. Strengthen each other. And if you can support as well, please do so. I love you all. 
God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.